The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our workplace violence webinar. This is Rebecca with WFIA. So I say this usually at the beginning of every webinar, but uh, during the presentation, I'm going to keep everyone in muted and listen-only mode. You can use the question panel um, on your screen to ask questions or do the hand raise button so that we know when we get to the question portion, um, we can make sure that you're unmuted and able to ask your questions. So with that, I am going to give this over to Tammy, who will introduce our guests. Thank you, Rebecca. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. We um, are so thankful to have Officer George Clark and uh, soon Rebecca Ziesmer will be joining us. I want to talk a little bit about them. I give you an overview. Uh, Officer George Clark has worked for the Olympia Police Department for almost eight years. He's worked as a neighborhood police officer for the last year and a half and worked patrol before that. As a neighborhood police officer, Officer Clark works closely with residents, neighborhoods, and property managers to solve problems that require longer term solutions. He works diligently to engage with residents in non-enforcement environments such as neighborhood meetings or special events. He's an instructor for the department in de-escalation of persons in crisis, defensive tactics, reality-based training, and TASER. He was selected to the peer support team for the department and trains recruits as a police training officer. Uh, so Officer Clark is with us and Rebecca Ziesmer has worked for the Olympia Police Department for the last six years as a civilian employee. She worked as a secretary, a program assistant, and has been in her current role as a senior program specialist for the last year and a half. Managing the OPD volunteers and community programs, she works with block watch groups, neighborhood associations, businesses, multi-housing managers, and residents to prevent crime and promote safety in Olympia through education and engagement. And we've asked them today to help us uh, with some of the de-escalation, some of the issues that's come up in the stores. Uh, we thought this was an excellent time to have them come and speak with all of us about some ways that we can hopefully keep things calm in the stores. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Officer Clark and let yeah. him start. So you bet. Well, yeah, thank you for the introduction. Happy to be here. Um, you know, pre-COVID, I did this kind of stuff uh, all the time and more in person. So it's it's a little strange talking to multiple people through a computer screen, but I guess we're all trying to work in this kind of new normal. So um, if there are questions and those kind of things, and we're going to have opportunity at the end, if anybody has come with kind of any pressing concerns i want to make sure that this is valuable and worth your time and you leave here um, hopefully better equipped to uh, kind of handle your jobs and this interesting scenario that we find ourselves in um, i will say i do a lot of talks on de-escalation i do a lot of talks uh, not only uh, outside in the community but also within the department De-escalation inside policing is different than de-escalation out in the world. And I'll explain the distinction just to make sure that we, I think, find it's important to define our terms. De-escalation in policing is everything you can do before having to use force. It's an unfortunate reality that sometimes we have to use force to stop somebody from harming somebody else or take somebody into custody to hold them accountable for whatever poor decision they may have been engaged in at that time. And we train numerous different tactics and techniques to try to avoid having to go what we call hands-on, having to grab people or use force and potentially putting ourselves, uh, members of the community and a potential suspect at risk of injury. Um, what de-escalation is not is trying, is, is thinking that there's just a magic word formula that will get you out of every scenario, okay? Um, De-escalation is taking reasonable means to protect yourself, protect other people, and try to avoid conflict. 
but understand that I'm sure if we could do a show of hands here, we can probably all come up with a scenario fairly easily to show how people come to us looking for conflict. And what I mean by that is specifically, I know that there's been a lot of talks about the mask protocol. Um, this isn't a surprise to anybody. Uh, this has been pretty much the only thing on the news, on the radio, uh, conversations around the uh, supposed water coolers, et cetera. Nobody walks into the store um, right now today with all the signs posted and everybody else walking in and putting on masks and is in any belief that they don't need to wear one. So understand that when people come in there, um, and you have to, or you're put in a position to potentially confront them, understand right off the bat that that person may be looking for a fight and not necessarily a physical fight, but some form of altercation. So what our goal here is today is to give you some tools, give you some things to think about and equip you to kind of understand when it's okay to involve the police, what your rights are, but understand too that you may all individually have store policies that you have to work under as well. So uh, I don't want you to take everything I say today and, and go and just implement it without um, working through the proper channels, management, et cetera, to make sure that what I'm telling you will work because you could be at any corner of this state and not solely in Olympia where I happen to patrol and work. So. Um, I hope the information is good. Uh, anything that I say, you know, certainly take it with uh, a grain of salt and make sure that it's going to work for your store, your location, and your teams. And I hope that it, this will give you the opportunity to network better with local law enforcement. If you haven't had the opportunity to do that already, we are here to serve you and make sure that your businesses can be conducted without out threat of violence from anybody um, so that you guys are safe, your employees are safe, and your customers are safe. And I think at the end of the day, that would be everybody's goal. So, um, and I can't see when Rebecca comes online. So let me know when she gets here. So, but she, sorry, we, she is here. Yeah. So. Okay, perfect. So Rebecca, I can let her uh, introduce herself a little bit too. And we have prepared, like, like we were talking before is, when we do these presentations, a lot of times they're in a big room and we have the ability to, you know, kind of do some questions and answers and make sure that we're steering it in a direction that is kind of relevant to uh, the vast majority of the people that we're engaging with. However, with a bunch of people all over the state, um, we decided for this presentation to at least start out with a uh, presentation that all that Rebecca is going to go through and share with you guys and I hope that will kind of cover the 30,000 foot view and the macro view and then I will come back at the end of that uh, to kind of clarify things um, if you guys have questions if you have some specific issue that keeps arising that you would like more uh, kind of advice on how to work through that um, I want to make myself available after the presentation for that so with that, I will uh, turn it over to Rebecca. Hi, everybody. Um, oops. I'm trying to get rid of this screen here. Sorry for the delay. There we go. Okay, so thank you for joining us. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and get started since we're already starting a little bit late. Um, so we're going to be talking to you about workplace safety um, at your businesses. So just right off the bat, workplace violence. So it's just violence or threat of violence against workers. So it can happen in any environment. Um, it can range from just verbal abuse to actual physical assaults. Worst case scenario, there you know some of them do end in homicide. So every year, one uh, on about that averages 1.7 million um, employees are injured. One in five people know someone who's capable of violence. A lot of times the violence comes from someone that um, your employees know uh, on a personal level. Um, there is a financial cost to 
workplace violence and loss of productivity, even for the people that weren't victims of a, a crime, the fear of it can affect their, um, their ability to work effectively in your business. So today, some of the topics that we're gonna discuss is just thinking about safety, determining your risk factor at your business, recognizing and preventing dangerous situations, communication and developing a plan. So when it comes to thinking about safety, one thing we like to reiterate over and over is that everyone is responsible for themselves and their own safety, for acting on unsafe conditions and for sharing information that can alert others. So if you're seeing something, it's that whole see something, say something, um, don't keep it siloed. There's so many incidents where after the fact, um, people are coming forward with all of these red flags or things that uh, maybe could have alerted people and um, nobody said anything beforehand. So almost all violence is preventable. Obviously that's not 100%, but um, if you're prepared to handle it, there is always the option to be able to prevent it. Verbal de-escalation works. Strong customer service skills um, prevents violence because you're able to de-escalate those customers. And the best defense against workplace violence is a trained and alert staff. Um, I'm not sure if George mentioned it, but we can, we do these presentations with, with businesses one-on-one. -on -one. So if you, um, you or your local agency might put them on, want us to come in and work with your team members, um, obviously right now it would have to be online, but we can do that to just help your team members start thinking about this. Uh, Rebecca, so, uh, yeah. jump in real quick. We can't see your screen. Oh, you can't? No. I thought it said I was sharing it. Um, you were sharing for a minute and then I don't know if you paused it or there you go. The back. Now okay. we can see it. There it is. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. All good. <laughs> well, here we are. <laughs> um, so levels of awareness. So there's four levels, white, yellow, orange, red. Um, we, you want to be in yellow, this constantly scanning your surroundings. So white in the oblivious, you're just an easy target. If you're just going about your day thinking about your joys, your problems, your personal life, and not paying attention to anything, you're making yourself an easy target. Um, you don't want to live in this orange level that is always focused on individuals or locations, and then you definitely don't want to live in this red hyper alert um, awareness level. You, you want to be in the yellow where you're constantly scanning your surroundings, paying attention, looking for strange situations. And then if you see something, you're moving into the orange level, um, focusing on what is causing you, um, you know, your intuition to say that something's wrong, and then planning for options uh, based off of what you're seeing. And then red, um, you know, if something is escalating, then you're moving into that red where you're preparing for either action, fight, or flight. Looks like maybe it froze. So determining your risk factors, you wanna think about your environment and the security in your environment, do a job assessment, and then how prepared are you um, to recognize something that, that may be happening. So when it comes to environment, uh, there's this philosophy in crime prevention called crime prevention through environmental design, we call it SEPTED. So it's the idea that the proper design and effective use of a built environment can lead to a reduction in the incidence and that fear of crime and just an overall improvement in the quality of life. It has an emphasis on the physical environment, um, affecting the behavior of people, uh, providing a productive use of space and the prevention of crime and loss. Um, this is a, you can take an all day class on this. We're just going over it really briefly, but we do again offer where we can come into your business and do a survey and give you suggestions for things you can do uh, that follow these crime prevention theories. And a lot of local agencies have that. So if you're not in Olympia, just reach out to your local agency. So there's four key SEPTED concepts, natural surveillance, access control, territorial behavior, and maintenance. 
Um, this is one of my favorite quotes. You're trying to keep the honest people honest and force the dishonest people to give away or modify their plan. So that's where you're using SEPTA to actually affect someone's behavior. So natural surveillance has to do um, with visibility. So cameras, security cameras are, have been huge for helping officers locate suspects. Um, it, you know, if there's not good witness descriptions, they have that, or maybe someone didn't see the crime, but then they have that security footage and can get that description out to other officers. Uh, the ability to look into your business. So are the windows blocked by vegetation? Um, do you have a really beautiful display in your window, but it prevents people from being able to see in and vice versa, see out? And um, the idea is that if something abnormal is happening right outside um, your business, but the windows are blocked, then no one's going to see it and be aware and be able to alert anybody. Access control is the more traditional crime prevention. So locks, signage, um, designing pathways, you know, how you want to direct people. A lot of the stores now have the, you know, the one-way files um, to help direct that behavior and the flow of customers. Territorial behavior has to do with designating, clearly designating private and public space. So creating a welcoming feeling for the, the wanted users and an unwelcoming feeling for undesired users. So you wanna celebrate entrances, you wanna make sure there's clear signs um, for employee only, or um, you know, if someone's not supposed to be back somewhere, having signs up, doors locked, things like that. And then maintenance is just keeping the appearance of the building maintained, clean, cared for, um, then people have this assumption that you're more likely to call the police because you've put that effort into caring for your building. So creating a physical security in the workplace mindset. I know that's a, a lot to say, but it's just that idea of having that security in your, in your business. So again, locking doors that you don't want public going into. Um, some of this applies to offices and I left it in because I wasn't sure um, I know the stores, some of it might not apply, but if there's some um, corporate offices that are off site or anything like that. So you wanna filter guests through a reception desk. Um, the stores kind of do that with the cashiers right up at the front who are able to, to say hi to people before they go back into the store and they're able to say bye to people and let um, customers know that they've been seen and, and can keep that visual eye on people. Um, you can use physical barriers to direct people again where you want them to go or don't want them to go. And a big one is again establishing part of your job to be alert for suspicious persons, activity, or behaviors. So if you're um, in that yellow zone scanning and you just make that a habit, it doesn't become extra work for you, but you're paying attention to what's going on. And I know a lot of stores do a really good job of that already because of shoplifting. Um, but you just wanna make sure your employees are well-trained on that. So where does workplace violence come from? Uh, the majority of the time it's somebody you know. I, I know the bigger concern right now is the strangers. Um, in offices, it tends to be you know, a family member, um, some sort of domestic violence dispute. Um, former coworkers can, can happen anywhere. Uh, one of the biggest threats is domestic violence because they're so motivated. They can get through a lot of different um, things that have been put in place to keep the victim safe. They just have that motivation and, and don't aren't really concerned about the consequences. So some job risk factors to consider. You know, whatever your job is, is it affecting someone's family, money, or work? Do you have to deliver bad news? Um, probably the biggest thing for your employees right now is could you be the target of transferred anger? They're not necessarily mad at you for the face mask um, policy, but they're just mad about it in general or mad about the government involvement or whatever it may be, but that anger gets transferred to you and your employees. And have you rehearsed what you'll do? You know, you're seeing things that are um, concerning. And so just running through your head how you might handle a situation. Um, everybody, you know, a lot of women are raised to say, carry your keys in your hand uh, to protect yourself when you're going to your car. 
but if you're not willing to actually stab somebody with those keys, that's not the right solution for you. Uh, maybe you're someone who would just be better off fleeing, or maybe you're a really good kicker and um, that would be your strong point if you were to be attacked. So just planning that and being realistic with yourself. So preventing dangerous situations. So trusting your instincts. A lot of people minimize something that's happening. Um, you know, they try and explain it away, but our instincts are what have, you know, gotten us to where we are now. And so just pay attention to that. Um, past experiences have led you to react in a certain way in certain situations. So you don't wanna just write that off and, and minimize whatever is happening to you or your employees. Use sound crime prevention techniques. So this has more to do with, you know, maybe when you're coming from the parking lot to your business, locking your car, rolling up your windows. Um, if you're coming at odd hours, having that buddy system so you're not entering all by yourself. And then considering what does suspicious mean? Um, it, what behavior is causing, you know, if you run through your head behaviors that would seem suspicious to you, then you're more apt to pay attention to them when you see them happening right in front of you. And also paying attention to the activity in your neighborhood or where your business is. So general crime, you can get at um, this website that I have listed here, thecrimereports.com. In Olympia, I do a weekly update. It, it doesn't include every crime, but it um, includes a lot. And so neighbors sometimes will use that to see what's happening right around where they li live. Uh, for businesses, you know, communicating with surrounding businesses. If you have a, a network group, like I know Olympia has a downtown business association and um, a couple other groups that are just businesses communicating with each other. And so making sure you're checking in and hearing what they're experiencing and what's happening um, with them. So these are some examples of what we recommend not to do. So what some people have said, um, if I'm attacked, I'll just freeze up and I won't be able to do anything. If someone tries to take my purse or breaks into my house, I'll do whatever I can to make sure they get nothing in mine or nothing will happen to me. Um, they're all kind of, there's no planning in any of those comments. Um, you, if you think you're someone who will freeze and you want to make sure you have a plan that you're not just going to be a sitting duck um, and you want to practice that in your head, how you're gonna react in the situation. We also, when it comes to the purse incident, um, you know, maybe you hold on to your purse or backpack and the, the suspect doesn't get it, but then you end up with a hurt shoulder and medical problems for years to come. Whereas if you just thrown your property down and created distance by running away, um, you wouldn't have that injury. You would be out the property, but you would be um, healthy and safe. And then, thinking that it's so safe and nothing's going to happen again. It's just like that first one. You don't have a plan for yourself and you're making yourself a, a, a viable victim. One of the biggest things um, when there's not security cameras, which is often, is being a good witness. And again, this is something you can practice. Um, it's just being in that yellow zone, paying attention to um, strange or inappropriate dress, behavior? Are they casing your building? Um, just the description of the person in, in general, it's just very, very important to the officers. And when we have good descriptions, they're often able to locate them even if they've left the scene. Um, one of the things George had pointed out when we were preparing for this is that most people know they're being inappropriate and we'll leave before police actually arrive. So if you're comfortable capturing a photo, um, make sure you get a description of the vehicle they leave in, get an accurate license plate. These things are gonna allow the officers to be able to follow up with that um, suspect and talk to them about the rights of each side, uh, discuss the behavior, potentially serve them with a trespass notice, just depending on exactly what happened. So we call um, sizing up a suspicious person, do like a visual pat down. So are they wearing a hat? Do they have any um, jackets or sweatshirts, specific colors? Do they have anything distinctive on under their jacket? Shoes, shoes are, off, are often um, 
really helpful because they can be so distinctive and unique to each individual person. Are they carrying anything? Backpack, umbrella, cameras, there's something in their hand that they may still have when the officers make contact with them later. <clears throat> Facial hairs, distinguishing marks or tattoos. And then are they wearing a tie, a bow tie, um, a distinctive necklace? And paying attention to the direction of travel that they go when they leave. If you know <clears throat> the direction that you're in when you're where you are relational to you, then when something happens and someone leaves, it's going to be that much easier for you to give that direction to the dispatcher to relay to the officers um, and hopefully help them get to that suspect quicker. So when it comes to people you know, so regular customers, employees, um, family members of employees, you wanna pay attention and recognize some of the changes that can oftentimes lead to workplace violence. Um, this is a whole, a whole list of them. Some of them are obviously um, uh, more noticeable than others, but you wanna, you wanna look out for things. If there's been a significant loss, you know, are they making comments um, talking about weapons or blaming others for the loss? Um, is there jealousy or unreasonable demands? These are things you want to recognize and if you can um, intervene before it escalates to any sort of violence. Being aware of mental illness is gonna help you get someone connected to professional help, again, before it might escalate into any sort of violence. Um, these are different things to look for. You know, does your business offer an employee assistance program that you can refer people to? Does your local law enforcement agency have some sort of program for crisis response? Uh, Olympia has our crisis response unit that we've had for about 18 months now and people can get referred to them and then connected to the resources that they may need to get the help they need and again prevent that violence from happening. So when it comes to assessing a threat, this is a whole, a whole list of things you can kind of think of. Um, I already said it once and I'll probably say it a few more times, but one of the biggest thing is to not minimize what you're seeing. Um, you know, when it comes to threats, are they using you know overt threats veiled threats against employees or property are they saying things that are in an attempt to intimidate you create fear or make you believe that they could actually carry out whatever threat um, they're issuing to you even threatening legal action um, you know they ha think they have their rights violated and they take out their cell phone to capture the evidence of it these are things you want to pay attention to because again they can escalate um, are they yelling at your employees, getting in their face, pointing fingers? Are they displaying tantrum behaviors? So toppling or knocking over displays, dumping out a basket or a cart. Um, you want to assess, you know, what you guys have been seeing compared to what's happening now. Um, have you had incidents with this person before? You just want to take all of that into consideration. One of the biggest things, again, um, if you know the person, has there been previous violence or previous property destruction? Because one of the biggest indicators of violence is a history of it. Um, so keeping all of that in mind when you're addressing whatever is happening. So just a couple key points before we move on to some other things. Um, what the biggest mistake professionals can make regarding workplace violence is minimizing it or excusing the behavior of whoever is making the threats. Um, and not taking action before it escalates into something further. And then two of the biggest indicators that an individual may be violent is, again, if they've been violent before or if there's alcohol or drug addiction. Um, those are two huge indicators and you want to keep that in mind with who, whatever customer you may be dealing with. So how do we communicate? Body language, tone of voice, in our words. So body language is about 68% of our communication. Tone of voice, 25%, and words is 7%. So this is really important when it comes to 
um, de-escalation, keeping this in mind when you're trying to keep somebody calm. Um, because your body language, you could be saying all the right words and your body language could be saying something completely different and that customer may escalate and continue up the chain um, of anger. So crisis defined, and I have to remind myself of this regularly with my with my six-year-old daughter, but it's an emotionally stressful event or traumatic change in a person's life. And whatever it is, it is very real to that person experiencing it. So logic isn't going to work with a teenager or a toddler. Whatever their crisis is, that's real to them. And you don't get to judge that. But if you react appropriately, you may be able to help mitigate um, any workplace violence that could come out of the crisis that someone may be in. So this is kind of an anger escalation scale. Um, some of you may have seen this before. Confused, frustrated, angry, hostile. People can move between these scales. You know, they could start at confused, jump up to angry, bump back down to frustrated. Um, you know, your goal with communication and de-escalation is to try and keep people from getting into the angry and hostile where they may then um, commit an act of violence. So confused, they're just, I don't understand why. They may just be saying, I don't get it. Why do I have to wear this mask? Frustrated, then they're angry that you won't fix it. Angry turns into short statements, kind of general threats. Um, well, I could do this. And then hostile is usually very direct. Like, I'm going to act this way. I'm going to get you. Um, and again, they can move between these these different scales and so you don't want to assume that if you've calmed them down that um that down back down to just confuse that they're not going to escalate back up so here's some different diffusing strategies and the number one is recognizing it um you know being realistic that this is happening so then you can do things to help diffuse um, you want to reflect calm. They may be yelling. You want to keep your voice calm. Um, yelling, trying to yell over them is just going to escalate the customer rather than trying to de-escalate and bring them back down. Um, active listening, so repeating maybe things that they've said to you. Chin shakes, agreeing even if you don't really agree. Um, sometimes apologizing even if you don't, um, you know, you didn't really do anything wrong. The idea is to just de-escalate that person and sometimes that can help. You want to avoid patronizing phrases, calm down, I know how you feel. Don't make false promises, you're going to be setting yourself up and others for failure. And technical jargon can get you in trouble because if you make the person feel like they don't know what they're talking about, it's just going to make them angrier. Um, avoid any insults or sarcasm and then pay attention to your nonverbal body language so that any defensive stances or rolling eyes or sighing, those are all things to avoid. So some skills for de-escalation, again, I mentioned it before, but you must control yourself to control others. So keeping your voice calm, even if they're not staying calm. Um, your first words can set the tone. So having simple questions like, what can I do to help you with this problem? Or I understand you're upset. Those are all things that can help calm somebody down. No one makes good decisions when they're angry. So you're wanting to um, you know, allow them to vent even if you're not agreeing with their, whatever they're venting about. Uh, be empathetic, nod, make eye contact. Um, just make sure they know that you are listening um, to help, you know, again, that venting can just bring them back down from that um, anger scale. Sometimes certain customers just don't gel with certain um, employees. So you can do a service swap and sometimes that works. Oftentimes the presence of additional coworkers or supervisor can help. Um, and then if you're concerned for the actual well welfare of the customer, call dispatch or have somebody else call dispatch. Um, even if you're not at the moment worried about a violent act, if there's something that, you know, there's a health concern, 
that you think needs immediate attention, make sure you call while you're still trying to de-escalate them. So one of the big things, um, you know, stating calmly and clearly what your store policy is, you want to give an advisement, so a warning with a consequence. Um, so you need to wear your mask or you're going to have to leave. And then you can you can move up. You know you need to wear your mask, or I'm going to call the police. Don't try to be kind and compassionate at the expense of your safety. Um, and if it doesn't subside, then you need to let them know you're going to call for help and follow through. And we say this at neighborhood meetings, these type of meetings. Don't feel guilty about calling 911. If you are in fear or um, not comfortable with what is happening then go ahead and call and the officers can come out and help diffuse the situation. Or sometimes, depending on the circumstance, it could be a crisis response unit, but don't feel guilty about calling. So de-escalating people with mental illness, um, obviously a little bit harder. Just remember that they're a person first and don't judge too quickly. You know, Could there be medical reasons that they're behaving this way? Model the behavior that you want, calm, quiet, respectful words and body language. Um, give explanations of what you're doing, being direct and brief. And then try to get to the core issue. If you can get agreement from them, so offering them a seat or offering them a drink of water and you get a yes out of them and then move on to another yes, that can calm people down. Um, be patient. One of the things, one of the trainings I did that I found helpful, it's okay to acknowledge hallucinations or delusions, but don't agree or contradict with them because um, that can cause confusion or make them angry, angrier, um, because sometimes they know that they're not real. And if you um, act, you know, acknowledge and act like they are, then they, they just get angrier and think you're um, mocking them. You definitely want to avoid humor because it may be lost on them and take any threats seriously. Um, again, don't be afraid to call. So there's four stages generally that we like to review um, with, of assault. And again, this is just like the anger stages. People can move between the stages. They can skip stages, um, but it's good to be aware of all four of them and know how to react and have some information on how to react accordingly. So the anxiety stage is when you may see somebody pacing, heavy breathing, hand wringing, voice change. Um, you know, if you're seeing any of these behaviors listed, don't ignore them. Make sure you ask if they need help. Um, if they get ignored, they can sometimes escalate into the next stage, whereas if they're addressed, they may just stay in that anxiety stage. You want to use positive statements at this point. So five, the rule of five, five words or less, five letter words or less. So we can make this work. I can tell you are upset. I want to help you. What can I do to help? All very simple, direct, easy for somebody in that anxiety stage to respond to. So the defensive stage tends to be the cursing, threats, challenging, refuse to be helped. Um, this is where you wanna give options or choices um, give the warnings, set limits to their behavior. You do want to give them the chance to respond to whatever you're telling them and try and help them resolve the problem. But if you see them escalating further, um, you need to be prepared for that. So in the defensive stage, one of the biggest signs that they may be moving into the physically, the next stage physically acting out is if they're invading your personal space. So you want to avoid toe to toe with whoever it is you're interacting, crossing your arms, having your hands behind you or any unsolicited personal contact and definitely don't point. Um, you wanna have your hands just open and at your sides, if possible, stand at a 45 degree angle. It just gives them less of a um, structure to strike at. If you have your hands at your sides be, uh, versus crossed or behind your back, they're easier to um, bring up to protect yourself if it becomes physical. So physically acting out stages where they're actually attacking others or destroying property. Again, a big warning sign is that invasion of your personal space. 
Here you want to make sure you're evading or calling 911 um, while you're evading, having someone else call 911. And the tension reduction stage is often they're just physically spent. And so sometimes people will think that it's over. Um, you still want to make sure you call emergency responders because, again, they can escalate back into any of those other stages. Um, you don't want to leave them alone and you want to make sure the police are called to end that cycle of violence, um, not knowing when they may move back to the physical stage. So one of the big things with your employees is developing a plan. So making sure you're sharing information with coworkers. I know jewelry stores that have code words, um, you know, that may not work for your business, but just considering it and talking about it with your employees. Uh, keeping a safe distance or barriers, determining what your limit is. Um, you can disconnect respectfully and, you know, being, making sure your employees know that they're able to do that. Call in other people if you need to. Um, if you have a regular customer that's a difficult person, assigning a point of contact for them, uh, planning ahead again to minimize risk. Um, when it, you know, some workplace violence happens out in the parking lot or right at opening or closing. So having a buddy system or things like that. Um, and then that self-assessment, what are you willing to do? What are your employees willing to do to survive? And then we put in here disaster drills. So I don't mean by that um, constant drilling or actually having formal drills like fire drills, but just it's that reviewing in your head. So having some strategies for employees to dis disassociate from the disorderly people, make sure it's clear to them what they can and can't do, what's appropriate. You know, did they come from a previous place where the customer is always right and they have to take verbal and disorderly abuse? Um, you know, if that's not how your business works, you need to make that clear to them so that they will share what they're seeing with other employees and remove themselves from situations that are unsafe. Um, do they feel supported in how they respond? So if you have regular meetings, this is something you guys should talk about um, at least occasionally, you know, just review with them the things that are okay for them to do to get out of these situations. Just make the discussion of it a regular part of your training. So what now, um, you know, we just encourage you to have the attitude that it can happen to you. Again, we don't want you to live in fear, but if you have a plan and you're prepared, then you're better likely to recognize something and be able to act appropriately to avoid um, workplace uh, violence. Be aware of your environment. Don't ignore the signs. You know, don't minimize what you're seeing. Address the issue and or report it. Um, remember your tools, so attitude, problem solving, communication skills, and then just one more reminder to drill um, just throughout your everyday life. You know, if someone's walking by, just pay attention to what they're wearing and make it a habit to notice. Um, go through your head what you would do if you were attacked. And so 911 tips, because we see it all the time where people are hesitant to call. Um, if you're not sure if you should call 911 or dispatch, a lot of people pre-program, I'm sorry, the non-emergency dispatch, a lot of people will pre-program that into their phone so they can just call it as quickly as they could call 911. Um, when you call, give as much information as possible, like we talked about earlier with the direction of travel, description of the car, license plate if you have it, um, description of the suspect. If you can't talk to the dispatcher, call and leave the phone off the hook. Um, Thurston County has enhanced 911, so they're able to determine your location. Um, and again, we say over and over, just don't be afraid to call. Um, it says there's no limit. That, you know, if you're calling because you have a concern, there's no limit on how many times you can call. Um, we want you to call if you're seeing something suspicious, if you're um, feeling threatened or your employees, we want you to be safe in your own work environment. And then again, I think I heard Officer Clark saying this, but um, if you're not from Olympia, contact your local law enforcement agency just to establish that relationship. 
um, see what training they may have that they can offer to your employees. You know, we try to keep these at an hour so that there's time for the presentation and questions and then um, it fits within people's scheduled breaks. I know we're flexible with the time of day we do them, um, so I'm sure other agencies are as well. And that is the end of the formal presentation. So if people have questions, this would be a great time to do that. Great, so I'm gonna go ahead and unmute people. So if anyone has questions, they can either unmute themselves and ask or use the question box. And I think we actually just got a question in the question box. So, okay, let's look. Uh, we are a grocery store on private property. We have had many people threatening to sue us because we can't let them in without a mask, especially when we have a customer that says they have a medical reason that they can't wear a mask. Uh, can our store actually have repercussions for turning them away, even though we are supposed to? Uh, we always tell them about uh, tell them about help or a place that they can buy their gross people who can buy their groceries for them and drop them off at their driveway porch and we never avoid helping them. Um, do you have any suggestions? I think that you're on the right track there. Um, we can't give legal advice per se, but that's something that everybody goes to, right? Everyone who wants to bring like a sugar glider into a store and say it's their service animal thinks that they're covered under the magical umbrella of ADA and HIPAA and you can't ask them anything about it. And when you actually dig into the law, that's not accurate. So it is true that if somebody has an underlying health condition that uh, they ne don't necessarily have to wear a mask, um, you can't necessarily ask them to wear it. And if you wanna chase this rabbit further down a hole, the question arises is what trumps what um, a state law or somebody who's not wearing a mask out of quote unquote protest um, and are using that as um, basically like a first amendment right freedom of speech issue. So this, this gets down the rabbit hole uh, pretty quickly. And there's one of the reasons why this is so complicated is because it's so new and there's so little direction. A lot of times when these things happen, as time goes on, there's there are lawsuits, there are court cases, there are clarifications that um, that come from government, that come from organizations, and those kind of things, and it becomes uh, more clear as time goes on. The problem is, is we've all just been thrown into this mess in the last few weeks, and there isn't there isn't clarity. So um, if you you know, it depends on the legal counsel you get from your store. If your policy is like, you know, the no shirt, no shoes, no service thing has existed for forever. Um, and that on private property always flew. So the mask is issue is being attributed the same as that. If someone says, I have a medical issue, I can't wear a mask uh, inside your store. Fantastic. I'll tell you what, um, here's our phone number. Go out to your car, call in, and we'd be happy to uh, get your groceries for you and bring them out to your vehicle. A lot of people are doing curbside things, online ordering, all that. So it's not as if they're going to starve and die if they aren't able to go into your store. Um, and if they push the issue further than that, then they're potentially being unreasonable. And if somebody has a huge emotional breakdown over that, again, they're probably showing up uh, looking for that fight. Um, when people start making demands, like if you don't let me X, then I'm going to Y, I'm going to sue you, I'm going to do this. Um, I don't, I don't feel that that's going to go super far, but I'm not an attorney. I do know that, that if they call the police and they demand for you to let them in and it's on private property, then that's not going to go very far. Um, when part of networking with police is understanding that on private property, if somebody becomes disorderly, you have the right to ask them to leave. Uh, if they do not leave, you have the right to have an officer uh, ask them to be trespassed. And usually trespass notices exist for one year. Um, so you do, don't, don't hesitate to utilize law enforcement if somebody shows up and is picking a fight. But I will tell you this, part of this is understanding the target 
acquisition, right? When they walk in, if you're the manager and you're the bearer of bad news and you walk up to the person and say, you can't come in here with a mask and they lose their mind on you and they start making veiled threats and being disorderly and yelling at you and, and everything else. And you can give them an, an advisement, which is a warning with a consequence and say, I'm sorry, you can't come in here with a mask. This is our store policy as best as we can figure out following the governor's orders. If you don't if you continue acting like this, then you're going to be trespassed, you can't be here. And if they continue, you can tell them, now please leave. And if they keep yelling at you, you can just keep repeating yourself. Be like, sir, ma'am, it's time to leave, please. Please leave now. And if they don't, um, something to consider is don't make yourself the door, right? And what I mean by that is if somebody's going to barge their way into the store, you don't need to put yourself in between this the groceries and of that okay they they probably statistically speaking don't mean uh other employees harm other customers harm they're probably going to come in and start you know godzilla uh wrecking the entire store because you asked them to wear a mask and they know they should if that kind of thing happens don't don't feel like you have to bar them entry okay you're not a bouncer you're a manager and we're trying to all figure this out together if that behavior happens and you've asked them, you've given them an advisement, you've asked them to leave, they've chosen not to, and they start yelling and carrying on, walk away and call the police. Because it's just as easy for us to show up and contact you at the service counter and you say, okay, this person's over in this aisle and they have a cart half full of groceries. Fantastic. We'll go contact them and say, it's time to leave. I'm like, well, they told me to wear a mask and I have to wear a mask for whatever reason. And, and our attitude is like, I'm not here because of your mask. I'm here because of your behavior. And you can't act in that manner on private property in this store. We are trespassing you. You're not allowed to come back for one year. This isn't a mask issue. This is a tantrum and behavior issue. And they do not have to put up with it. So look at it like that. Um, if they do enter the store and you know they they you know uh, grab a basket full of groceries and they're still being uh, verbally abusive and, and ranting and raving and carrying on and they load all of their groceries from a cart or a basket onto a, a conveyor belt at a check stand, walk over to the checker, turn off the check stand, leave them standing there with all of their stuff standing on the conveyor belt, not getting checked out. Move the checker to another check stand or something. Just do not serve that person. Do not engage with them until at which time the police can come and try to get them removed and salt. And if they try to make dumb decisions like smashing spaghetti sauce on the ground or just walking out with the groceries without paying, well, now we have other crimes that they could be cited or go to jail for, uh, pr namely being not only disorderly conduct, but destruction of property and theft. Does that help answer that question? I think that was really helpful. Thank you. Uh, does anyone else want to jump in? You should all be unmuted and able to talk if you so choose. Oh, we do have one more. What advice can you give us for when a customer is getting in an employee's faces or taking pictures or video? So taking pictures or video, um, that is, that's, that's effectively like electronic bullying nowadays. People think that if they have um, a, a video recording of yelling at uh, a store employee or a manager that they're on some crusade. So if somebody wants to walk through talking on the telephone, Skyping on the telephone, live streaming their grocery shopping experience, that's because it's in a place where people reasonably don't have uh, an expectation of privacy because it is a public place. They couldn't do this in your house. But because it's a store, because it's a, a reasonably public place, even if it's on private property, if they want to record anything, take photos, uh, they, they can. Um, so what they're trying to do though, is like we mentioned in the PowerPoint, is generally when they take out the phone and they start recording, that's a manipulation tactic to try to cow the person they're talking into that, oh, now I've got all this evidence of you doing X, Y, and Z, 
and I'm going to use this as evidence to sue you, okay? Or I'm going to use this uh, to, you know, blast you online or to make some complaint or have it go um, viral, okay? Well, most of the time when those things happen, if the employer person is being reasonable, and is clearly, even if the person is yelling and screaming, if they're clearly and calmly stating what their store policy is, and they can be honest, they can say, look, I don't like wearing these masks either, but it's our store policy and it's the governor's orders. So if you don't want to put on a mask, please leave. Well, I've got this and ADA and HIPAA and blah, 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 blah. Okay, well, we'd be happy to serve you through our online portal, or you can call in and we'll bring groceries to your car um, is for a touchless transaction uh, because we are so concerned about your pre-existing medical issues that we know you don't want to get the coronavirus. And there's other ways that we can assist you in that. So uh, either way, you're going to have to leave the store. And if you choose not to, then we're going to call the police and they can try to work through this in another way. And uh, just because somebody takes out a camera um, doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing the wrong thing, right? They're documenting themselves being unreasonable as much as they're trying to document uh, whatever their imagined slight is. So again, this is just when that happens and being a police officer, I, I'm not entirely sure I could wave to a kid in the park without having five cameras on me at all the time. So it's something you kind of get used to. Um, and is, if you act in manner that's professional and you have clear direction and insight as to what your store policies are and you are within those guidelines, then I wouldn't live in a position of fear or feel like that you have to give in or get verbally abused by somebody. Um, a lot of times when people get in these confrontations, if they don't have clarity as to to what the store policies are, then they feel like they're out in the wind. And employees might be scared that they're gonna be disciplined or fired because they told the wrong person that they could wear a mask and they told the wrong person that they couldn't wear a mask. So a lot of this is gonna be on the managers to train and equip their employees, not only to understand what the direction, what the, the best legal direction is at that moment, understanding it could change tomorrow with one press conference, but, giving them and prepping them with the best information available in your county and you can contact local law enforcement to help get that clarification or local council to help get that clarification but if they're equipped with the best knowledge and they're acting in a professional manner and they're acting in a way that genuinely is just trying to be respectful of people then they're not going to get hemmed up and they can act in confidence knowing that they're gonna be supported by the store, they're gonna be supported by you guys, um, and they're also not gonna put themselves at any kind of risk. And understand it's okay to walk away. A big pre-attack indicator is if you're in an altercation with somebody and you leave to go call the police or whatever else and they start following you, that might be the difference between calling the non-emergency dispatch line and calling 911. Somebody choosing to press the fight with you when they have the freedom to walk away, they're not being blocked, they're not being barred, they're not being detained, they're, they're not caged in somewhere. The fact that they want to follow you to continue a fight is a pretty good pre-attack indicator and it's something that you should be definitely cognizant of. I will add, People making veiled threats in this state, threats have to be very specific to be prosecutable. Um, so if somebody, for example, says, I'm going to punch you in the nose if you don't let me inside the store. Okay, well, that's a pretty clear threat. And if you're in fear and believe that that person is capable of carrying that out, then that's something that's potentially a crime in the state of Washington. But if somebody says something to the effect of, if you don't let me in, you're not going to like what happens. That's a veiled threat. That's probably not a prosecutable threat, something that an officer is going to arrest on. However, understand that veiled threats easily fall under the definition of somebody acting disorderly. They wouldn't say that if they weren't trying to wield power over somebody, elicit some type of reaction and put them in fear or get their way. Okay, this is all power and control wheel psychology stuff. So even if you feel like somebody is making some type of veiled threat, just because you may know now that that's not going to be potentially an arrestable offense doesn't mean that that won't rise to the level of the person being disorderly. And once you hit that disorderly checkbox, and it doesn't take a lot to get there, 
then that person can be trespassed from your store for at least a year. And if they come back, then they're subject to arrest. And if somebody comes back to the store after being trespassed, that's a felony. It's this, that's a commercial burglary in this state. Wow, that is really interesting. I didn't know all that about um, about that. Um, we don't have any more questions in the box. We do have a couple of thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for the presentation. So, well, you bet. We're happy to do it. Um, you know, these are these are interesting times. Um, twenty twenty has been a roller coaster. I hope everyone out there is, is just being safe and doing the best that you can. We are all learning this together. So um, I know that everyone out there that has been these essential employees that have that have gotten us through this so far, all of you guys, I, I just can't tell you um, how much we appreciate having you there. I definitely look at our community as being in partnership. Um, I, I am sorry that people can be jerks. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, but there are a lot of people that are stressed, that have lost their jobs, that don't know maybe where their next grocery run is coming from. So I guess I would close everything with, with just try to keep showing grace to people because when people walk in, we don't know anything about them. We don't know if they're at the store uh, because, and to buy booze because they're an alcoholic and they're in withdrawals. We don't know if they're having mental health crisis and they're due to their doctors being in, in coronavirus stuff if they're not able to be medicated. We don't know if they've lost their jobs and they don't know where their next uh, paycheck is coming from. We don't know if they lost their jobs and they can't get unemployment. Like There's all these things we just don't know about people when they walk in and we meet them. All we do know is how they behave and that behavior while you don't need to put yourself at risk just understand that when you leave one of those altercations don't put that in your backpack and carry it around with you the rest of the day the rest of the night the rest of your career that person is accountable for their own decisions they're accountable for their own words they're accountable for their own behavior and just because somebody yells at you or yells at one of your employees doesn't necessarily mean it's a personal attack. You don't have to take it personally, and that's easier said than done. But something I get a lot of practice on as a police officer is understanding that people don't always mean what they say when they say mean things. Okay? So what I hope you guys take away from this is, number one, just be safe. Network with your local law enforcement. Do the best we can with all the strangeness and the, the changing dynamic and show grace not only to, to people coming in that um, are super frustrated, but show grace to yourself and show grace to your employees too. Because uh, I don't know what the rest of the year has in store for us, but I do know we're all in this together. And I wish you all health and safety. And if there's anything else that myself or Rebecca can do to give clarification, answer questions, or uh, anything else, please feel free to reach out, okay? Officer Clark, thank you and Rebecca for this presentation. It's been wonderful. We greatly appreciate it. Any final closing? All right. Well, have a great day. Evening. All right. You guys too. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Bye.